Again, our Father, we come to you today thanking you for the many blessings that are ours this morning. Father, we thank you for the Sunday school time, for the faithfulness of the teachers. Father, we thank you for all that you have given us through your word already this morning, through our time of study. And now, Father God, through the time of singing and bringing all these biblical principles as we bring honor and glory to your Son by bringing worship and praise through song. And Father, we have gathered here today to open your word, to seek your wisdom, and that you would speak to each and every heart. And that, Father God, our hearts would be filled to overflowing, that we could say as we leave this place that our God reigns, that it is truthful, Father, that you are a blessing to us, and that each and every day that as we walk with you and as we Work with your will, Father. We find your blessing each and every day. And so today, Father, as we've come to hear in this moment, in this time, in this place, we ask once more for your blessing, that we might take this wisdom, Father, and apply it to our lives. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 23. We have a very unusual text today. Uh, you know, the Bible is always filled with, I think, practical information. I think the Bible is filled with practical ways of dealing with life. And today is one of those texts, I believe, as, as God's child that God give, had given to us, that we might understand the good and the bad and the good times and the hard times of life and how we are to live and how we are to react in all of them. Grief is a very, very hard thing, folks. We don't learn grief. We're not taught grief in school. We watch it. We see how people deal with it, and we tend to try to react to grief the only way we know how, and it's tragic. Sometimes we're not taught the proper ways. Some ways we're taught, sometimes we're taught how not to deal with grief. But the Bible here in Genesis chapter 23 is going to speak to us of grief. And it's there's going to speak to us of two types of grief. First of all, there is a public grief. There is a time for public grief. And then it's going to show us that, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a time for private grief. There is a duration is different for each one of them. The duration and time in which we have for our public grief and which we have for our private grief are different. And also the purpose is different. The purpose for public grief is totally different than the purpose for our private grief. And it can be functional. It doesn't have to be dysfunctional. We're going to see here that Abraham is going to have a time of grief we're going to see that it's not only private or public, excuse me, but it's private and also a preparation for the burial of his wife. There is appropriate grief. We're going to see that. And then there's inappropriate grief or what I call abnormal grief. There are people who grieve too long. There are people who grieve too hard. God did not give us grief that we would become inappropriate or we would become abnormal. Abraham is going to show us how to grieve properly in this text. The grieving process is not forsaking the memory of our loved ones. Understand that. That is not the grieving process. People are so afraid today. They're afraid, I think, one of the big things is if I don't pay attention, if I don't stay in this grieving matter, I'm going to either look like I have forgotten them or I will indeed forget them. And that is not true. Grief is not forgetting the person's memory. But what the grieving process is and what it does, it leads us. It leads us to surrender from our presence the personal life of the individual. That's what grieving is. Let me explain it this way. The grieving process is simple. It's not difficult to understand if you can understand this illustration. Any relationship that a human being has, we establish 
a depth of relationship with that individual. What I liken to it, or what a lot of people liken it to, is an emotional umbilical cord. It's different for each individual. You have people at work that you are friends to. Grief is a reaction to loss. It's not a reaction to death. You grieve all the time. You just don't see it as grief. You grieve when you lose a job. You grieve when you lose a friend. You grieve when you move away. You grieve when you have something broken that you had for years like an old trophy or something that was very important to you or, or an old dress or whatever. I, I don't know what you count as important to you, but sometimes we'll lose something or, or it'll fall apart or it'll be broken, and we grieve over it. But grieving is with the relationship is very simple. We develop this relationship, and each relationship, again, as I said earlier, is different. The person you have just a passing relationship with like at work or whatever it's a very thin cord or family member a friend a relative a spouse it's a very thick cord a very very thick cord perhaps tree trunk thick and what the grieving process is is indeed this it is the severing of that cord of relationship that's what the grieving process is it is letting go and our protest is we don't want to let go. Our protest is we shouldn't have to let go. But the world in which we live, folks, the only way we get out of, life, uh, out of this world and into heaven is through the death process. It's a matter of the curse. It's the matter of what God cursed Adam and Eve with. It's a matter of what our parents got for us when they fell from in, in sin from the perfect will of God, from the perfect world of God. Death has been our number one enemy from that very beginning, from the very beginning of time. From the moment that Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden to this very day, the Bible tells us that death is our enemy. All through the pages of the Bible, you'll see in Genesis, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Jesus came into this world that we might add a statement to that. And he died and lived again. And he died and lived again. And he died and lived again. Jesus came to change all of that. God promises us that those who believe in him, he will not likewise perish, but will have eternal life. Let's take a look at this time of Abraham's mystery and mourning. We've got a mystery. We're going to start right out with a mystery, and then we're going to have a period of mourning. Look at verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died at Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, O Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place, that you may bury your dead. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, where he, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. Let's stop there and, and look at what we see so far. We see, first of all, the testimony of Abraham's grief. Abraham grieved at the passing of his wife, Sarah. They have been through a lot. She is a hundred, how old? A hundred and twenty-seven years old. But we have a mystery here. We see in verses one and two, the humanity of Abraham. Why is it that we take the characters of the Bible and we put a big S on their chest for super saints and we say that only they know how to handle things in life, 
only they can do this. We could never be like them. It's not true. These are normal human beings recorded in God's word to give us the insight and periods of their life that we might know how to live as they lived, or we may, not, we may know how not to live in some cases in the lives of people. But in this case, we see it's a how to live in a time of grief. In verse 1 and the first part of, one, of verse 2, we see a time of mystery. A time of mystery. Look at the duration of the, of the matriarch in verse, in verse 1. The Bible says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Now, this is the only place in the Bible, the only place in the Bible where the actual age is given for a woman. And women for centuries after have never given their age again. <laughs> but it's true. This is the only place. The, the closest we come is the little girl at, at, at Capernaum who was almost 12 or about 12, it said. But this was actual date. Bingo, 127 years old. And you want to know why they did that? Because, and they divided it weird. Did you see how they divided it? Well, that's just the way the old people wrote, right? No, that's not it. They divided it in ways of showing the importance of the periods of her life. They're going to do the very same thing with Abraham when Abraham dies later on down in the chapters. But we're going to see that it's a very significant thing in the Jewish, Jewish text. And what we see here is Sarah, the, the, the Jewish commentator said that they did this, that they actually gave the age of Sarah because it signified her importance. That she had these many years that she could live and that every year that she lived was lived for God. Now, she was not perfect. She had her imperfections, as we've seen before, as we traveled through Genesis. That's not what the Bible's talking about. What the Bible is talking about is the significance of her years that she lived for God and the faith that she showed. You know, one of the nice things about being saved and born again, the Bible says he casts our sin as far as the east from the west to remember it no more. It didn't say that Sarah lived 127 years and died in her sins. It didn't say, and she was a very sinful woman, and blah, blah, this or that. No, the Bible says it gave her great significance. That ought to give us hope, folks. God is not here in our text. Once we have received Christ, once we are born again, God does not hold our sin against us. And in the Old Testament, with the economy of the sacrifice, once the sacrifice was made, the sin was covered. And so we see that Sarah's sins were covered and were not mentioned here. But great importance was shown. You don't see how old Eve was. You don't see how Noah's wife didn't even have a name in the Bible, for goodness sake. It was just Mrs. Noah. Here we have Sarah, 127 years Sarah. The only place, it signifies great importance, which distinguishes her. And what distinguishes her? Her faith as we're going to see later on. Do you know who writes the epitaph for this woman? God does. And we're going to see that at our conclusion. We see the death of the matriarch. Now, there is a legend. I want you to read something very unique here in verse 1. We see that she lived 127 years. Look at verse 2. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. They were separated. Do you, do you see back in verse 19 of the previous chapter? So Abraham, this is after he offered or, or brought Isaac and bound him on the altar. We see that Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now we have verse 2. Here she is in Hebron, which are a few miles north of Beersheba. Well, maybe she was visiting family. No, family wasn't there. Remember, she left Ur of Chaldees. There is no family in Hebron. And so she's up there. Now, according to Jewish legend, it is, it is said that Sarah died there in, in, uh, in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, of a broken heart. She had learned what God's command to Abraham was. She died at 127. Now, the Jewish 
commentators said that Abraham, when he offered Isaac on the altar, he was 137 and Isaac was 37. Now, we know that Sarah was 10 years younger than Abraham. So we're putting it right about the same time. 10 years different. She's a 127. She dies. Abraham is 137 when he offers Isaac. And so the legend is that Satan came to Sarah and told him, told her what Abraham was going to do. Did not tell her the rest, but told her that Abraham had gone to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, which was, by the way, a practice of the heathen in that area. The people of that area practiced child sacrifice all the time. God had prohibited it, but at this point, God had taken Abraham and basically tested his faith. And Satan, according to legend, had gone to Sarah and said, Bingo, your husband has taken your son, your only son Isaac, to kill him for an offering. According to the legend, she, broke a, she died of a broken heart. This is according to, again, the Jewish legends. We don't know. It's speculation. Why was she in, why was she in Hebron? Why was he in Beersheba? No, they weren't divorced or anything, but they were living in different places. Here he comes to mourn. In verse 2, we see it's a time for mourning. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Why is there a difference between the two? Most of us today think it's the same thing. Mourning is crying, weeping, and wailing. No, no. Now, see, in the Middle East, mourning is different than weeping. In fact, a lot of places in the Middle East, they'll have hired mourners. In Jesus' time, they, they had the hired mourners. You'd be paid to come in and, and wail and, and, and do all kinds of moaning and everything because the more you cried and the more you moaned, the more you, the more you show, quote-unquote, respect for the dead. Now, we don't have that in our culture. We don't have that in our culture at all. However, in Abraham's time, we see there's a difference between mourning and weeping. Can I say what that difference basically is? You see, first of all, there's a time of public grief. He came to mourn. Folks, there's a time of public grief when we weep, when we, we show a public display of grief. And that basically in our culture is during the time of the funeral. That is a time of our public mourning, is it not? We're expected to do certain things. We're expected to be there. We're expected to, to go and have people come in and talk to us. It's a time of showing, a time of greeting people as they come to pay their respect for our departed loved one. It's a public grief, is it not? Aren't there certain things we're supposed to do for this? Then there's a time for private grief. And that private grief is when Abraham came, came to weep. He came to mourn and he came to weep. And there was a public display and there was a private display. The problem with us today as it was in Abraham's time is when we mix the two. There is a time when we make, we confuse the two when we feel like our private time is a public display and it's not true, folks. Grieving is important. Don't, I'm not trying to demean that whatsoever. Grieving is extremely important. But we see here is although Abraham's grief was great. Again, according to the Jewish commentaries, it says, Although Abraham's grief was infinite, the full measure of his pain was concealed in his heart and the privacy of his home. There is a private grief that we have for those, there's that severing of the umbilical cord, that emotional umbilical cord that we don't share with anybody. That's just our private grief that's between us and the Lord. And God comforts us in our private grief. God comforts us in our time of need. God comforts us in our privateness when we come to Him and bear our soul to Him. Whereas in our public grief, we basically bear our sorrow to our friends. A lot of times people say, how are you doing during that time of grief? They really don't want to know, do they? And a lot of times we'll overcome ourselves and, and we'll give that private grief when in essence they wanted the public grief, right? And we understand that today. 
Abraham had a time of public grief, and we see him as he went to mourn, and a time of private grief, a time to weep for her. Death, again, is our number one enemy. Jesus came to change all of that. Again, the problem is when we confuse the two, the public versus the private. Then we see the hu- no, we saw the humanity of, of Abraham in verse 1 and 2. Let's look at the humility of Abraham in verse 3 through 9. This is a part of his public grief too. We see the response and sorrow in verse 3 and 4. And then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. We see his rise of hardship. The Bible says, Then Abraham stood up from before his dead. Now, in the Old Testament, mourners in Abraham's day basically sat and slept on the ground. That was part of the public mourning. They did not sit in comfortable chairs. Even to this day, the Jewish people, in their customs of mourning, will not allow themselves to be comfortable during their time of public mourning. They will not go to movie theaters. They will not go to shows. They will not go to, to, to plays and things like that. They will, they will neglect that over a period of time, 30 days, sometimes to 90 days. They will not show any public uh, uh, time of, uh, of recreation or anything like that. In Abraham's time, they didn't have movie theaters to go to. They didn't have the things like that. And so basically, how they showed their grief? Well, they just didn't allow themselves to be comfortable. They didn't sit in a chair. They didn't recline in a a nice bed. They sat on the floor or they slept on the bed. And that's basically what they did. We see that in uh, Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground and keep silence. They throw dust on their heads and gird themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem bow their heads to the ground. There are certain things that people did in public grief. Today we might say we wear black. That's our our big way of showing that we're in grieving. Or that we have flowers at a funeral or that we have, you know, different things, music or whatever we have. There was a display of public grief. We have a rise of hardship. He got up out of his grief, so to speak. The reality is, folks, yes, there is grief, but there is life even in the midst of grief. There are things we have to do, even in the time of grief. We can't shut everything off. We can't turn everything off. We still have to to pay the light bill during this time. We still have to do different things during this time. We still have to, to eat. We still have to do those things. What's nice in our public grief time is when friends come and help us with that. We give meals to people. We'll bring food. We have a meal for the family after the the funeral or whatever, and we continue to give food during that time. We try to help them in their time of of grieving. But Abraham didn't have that family. The Bible doesn't even say Isaac was there. We assume he's there. We assume the rest of the family's there. We would think that they were there. But it just zeroes in on Abraham, and Abraham is dealing with this grief. He stands up, I've got to do something. I've got to get a place of burial. Look at verse 4. The Bible says his reputation of humility. In verse 4, the Bible says, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. This is his, his aspect of showing who he is. He said, I'm a foreigner. I'm not from this area. I'm from Ur of Chaldees. I'm a sojourner. I'm a stranger and a sojourner in your land. I'm just passing through. And then we see also in verse verse 4, his reference to burial. This is the first time, by the way. People have died for, for many, many years in the book of Genesis. But this is the first reference to burial. This is where we get the aspect that Christians and Jews bury their dead. They don't cremate them. They bury them. Now, I'm not saying that that there's a prohibition of cremation, because there's not. There is no prohibition of cremation in the Bible. The Bible uh, teaches us that we are to bury our dead, to show respect to those bodies who are left behind. We see here it's a, a reputation of humility. This is the first reference of burial. Jews, again, in general, bury their dead. They do not participate in in cremation. 
the, the report was that, that he was a stranger in the land. He was a sojourner in the land, and he wanted things to be different. We see that in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says that he left her of Chaldees to search for a city whose maker and builder was God. And so he went all through Canaan land, never, never literally was promised the whole land. The whole land was his according to God. But he never owned a piece of land. He took tent places and did this. In reality, this is going to be the first place he's going to buy. The first place that he is going to buy in this world is a temporary place, folks. Let me say this to you. Our days are numbered here, each and every one of us. We're not going to be here forever. Every one of us are going to have to buy at least one bit of property. You say, I don't want to own any property. I don't want to own any land. I, I tried to tell my insurance agent years ago when we first got married. He had no sense of humor. He said, we just first got married. We're just young kids in our 20s. And he said, oh, by the way, do you have a will? And I said, well, no, we don't. You know, he said, well, you, I, I really recommend you get a will. And he said, now, I really recommend you get a burial plot. I'm 20-some years old. Who's thinking of dying? So I said to him, can I rent one? He said, a burial plot? I said, yeah, can I rent one? He said, no. Why would you want to rent one? I said, well, I'm not going to be in there all the time. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm not going to die right away. Obviously, if I go out and buy it tomorrow, I won't need it for a while. I said, secondly, the rapture is going to happen. Why would I want to buy one? I'm not going to be occupied in there any length of time. He had no sense of humor. But anyway, he probably thought, what a nut job. But anyway, <laughs> we see his rise of hardship and his, and his reputation of humility. But look at, in verse 4, also his request of honor. For a burial place, give me a property for a burial place from you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Again, that term, out of my sight, is a reference to burial. We see here's a request of honor. He's, he's wanting to bury his wife. I need to bury her. You know what's very unique here is Abraham didn't say, I'm going to take my wife back to Ur of Chaldees. That's where her grandfather, was, her dad and mom were buried. That's where her grandfather were buried. You know, I've got family buried all over this country. And I'm talking about immediate family. I've got two brothers buried in southern Indiana. My mom is buried in Texas. My dad and brother are buried in, in, in uh, Jeru uh, Jerusalem, in Jacksonville. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. But anyway, the bottom line is, folks, and I've told my wife, you plant me where I've dropped. I don't, I don't want you to take me to either one of those places. Folks, listen, we're here temporarily. The burial is just for a temporary. We're going to rise again. The earth cannot keep us. The Bible says that Jesus said, I come to give you life. And you know what? This body that I have here today that's going to die one day is going to be placed in the ground, and Jesus is going to come for it one day and to redeem it. We see here his reputation of humility and his request of honor. Next we see their reply of sympathy in verse 5 and 6. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, o my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. <laughs> Excuse me. We see the reply of sympathy. We see their esteemed homage. They say to him, You are a mighty prince. You know what that literally means? You are a prince of God. They knew Abraham's reputation. You are a prince of God. You are a man of God. We wouldn't withhold anything from you. Remember when Abimelech was told when he took Sarah and put him in his harem and was going to make her his wife? And God came to him in a dream and said, I'm just giving you a deadly disease and your whole family a deadly disease. And if you don't let go of this woman and give her back to her husband, he's a prophet. I'm going to kill you. And Abimelech says, say what? <laughs> You're going to kill me? He says, you already have the disease. You're dying right now. And unless you go to the prophet Abraham and have him pray for you, you're going to die. Give him back his wife. They knew that Abraham was a prophet. Folks, people know your testimony. 
please don't think that testimony has to include your perfection because it doesn't. You're not perfect. Don't act like it or believe they think you are (laughs) because others know you're not perfect. The bottom line is they knew that Abraham wasn't perfect. Abimelech said, look, he lied to me. Pharaoh could have told him earlier, Abraham lied to me, told me it was his sister. Well, it was a technicality in Abraham's part, but the reality was it was not the right way to doing it. But Abraham was still a man of God. In fact, not only was he a man of God, they said, you are a prince of God. What a testimony. Wouldn't it be great for someone to say to you, you are a prince of God or a princess of God? We see here a a response of humanity in Abraham, but we also see a response, his humility of sorrow and sympathy. Look at their endeavor of honor in verse 6 also. The Bible says, none of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. Now, back then, it was a big thing among the heathens that they had big monuments, had big things. They, you know, pharaohs were so huge about it, they made huge pyramids for one person dead. I was over there in, in, in Egypt, and we got to go up inside one of the pyramids, and we crawled up, I mean, literally, almost on our hands and knees, crawled up to the top there, the Cheops tomb, And we went in there, and it was just a little small room for one person. I thought, my gosh, you built this whole thing for one person. Well, they had a place down below for the wife, but the the whole bottom line was one person. And they they would build these huge edifices. And they said to Abraham, you pick anyone you want. We have all these monuments around here. We have places for our family. You choose anyone, and we'll give it to you. That's how much they... They respected Abraham. We see in verses 7 through 9 the request of significance. Look at his position of respect with Abraham in verse 7. The Bible says very simply, Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. Now, we see here that he bowed in respect, his position of respect. In the Oriental world, in the Middle East, is right smack dab between the middle. And a lot of the Oriental cultures come into the Middle East. And the bowing, as a pastor of a Chinese church for seven years, bowing was not an act of worship. Bowing was an act of respect. And it depended how low you wanted to bow, how much you wanted to show respect. A lot of times it was just a simple, courteous nod. But Abraham here showed their respect. He was repaying their respect to them. He just bowed simply to them, thanking them for what they had done for him. Folks, we ought to be appreciative of what people do for us, especially in a time like this. We see his position of respect. Look at verse 8, his person of regard. In verse 8, the Bible says, And he spoke of them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead on my side, hear me and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me. Now, In verse 7, we see he bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. Basically what that's talking about, the word you could substitute there when it talks about here in verse 7, the sons of Heth, you you could put the word parliament there. He is in the gate of the city there in Hebron, and he's talking to the elders, the sons of Heth. And he's talking to these elders. Ephron is there. And this is how respectful Abraham is. Abraham is saying to them, would you speak to Ephron for me? I'm not even going to speak to him. Again, it's it's humility. He says, this is your leader, Ephron, over here. You speak to him for me. Ephron is right there listening. But Abraham won't even go so far as to say, hey, I can't speak to him. You speak to him for me. And we see in verse 8, he just says simply, Would you speak to Ephraim, the son of Zohar, for me? Why? Look at verse 9. We see his place of request. That he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. Abraham's wanting the cave at the end of Ephron's field. Why Hebron? Well, there's two basic reasons why Abraham's going to bury Sarah in Hebron. Number one, it was practical. Jews bury within 24 hours. Okay? 
That was practical. It was just, you know, they didn't have funeral homes, didn't have embalming, didn't have anything. Let's just practical. Let's bury him now. Number two, it was personal because Abram had an altar there at Mamre nearby. The cave of Machpelah was near the altar where Abraham had been worshiping God. Abraham, though he didn't buy one parcel of land in Cana, it all had been deeded to him and given to him by God. Abraham did not buy any land except this cave and the field next to it. But yet he built two things in the, all throughout the land. He built an altar and he built a well. The altar was a place of spiritual renewal. The altar was a place of spiritual worship. The well was a place to renew his physical body. Okay? And so Abram had built a well and an altar there and also at Beersheba. And so he placed them all over. He said, this is very practical for me, very personal for me. The word Machpelah, by the way, means double, which denoted that the cave had at least two stories. So that it was a large cave. And Abraham's intent was simply this. I'm going to bury my family there. This is a place I'm going to make as my family mausoleum. This is a place that I'm going to bury my family. And it was. You can go there today. You can go to Hebron today. And there over the cave of Machpelah, Pilate was an old church, a Byzantine church that's been converted, depends on what time of year you, you, be, you look at in history, converted from mosque to church, from mosque to church. Now it's a mosque still today in Hebron. There is Abraham and Sarah. There is buried Isaac and Rebekah. And there also is buried Jacob and Leah. Now Rachel is buried outside of Bethlehem where she died. I've been to, my wife and I have been to Rachel's tomb. We have not been to Hebron because it's very difficult to get into Hebron, even today. If you go to Hebron, because most of it's, it's basically controlled by the Muslims, it's very difficult to get there. But even the Muslims revere Abraham and those people that are buried there. But this cave is still there today. You can go there today and see uh, the place where Abraham and Sarah are buried. But he sees this as a place of great significance, a place to bury his family. Each of the mausoleums or, or the tombs of the ancient Middle East times had at least two rooms. One was a weeping chamber. Another one was the place where the body was to be laid. You can see that when you go into the tomb of Jesus. It was a borrowed tomb from Josephus. No, excuse me, Josephus. From <coughs> Not from Josephus. From jo uh, Pardon? Yeah, Joseph of Arimathea. And there you can go in and see the two chambers in a smaller tomb there. But in the Machpelah, it would be a larger, obviously, larger area. So we see the testimony of Abraham's grief. We're going to continue later on, but we're going to see here the transaction of Abraham's grief as he buys this place. But I told you that God wrote Sarah's epitaph. What do you put on the tombstone? Today we have tombstones. And you put on there this little something. When, when I put my dad's tombstone on, uh, the military, that we buried him in a military funeral uh, and a, a military graveyard, and, and, and they asked to put a, what I want to put on his thing. And, and I had a very interesting scripture that I put on there and a lot of different things. What epitaph did God write for Sarah? Let's turn quickly to the book of Hebrews all the way back in your New Testament. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We're going to look at verse 11. The testimony of Abraham's grief. He came to bury his wife whom he loved. Abraham was not alone, folks. You know, we may be the, I, I remember the probably the most loneliest funeral I ever had was that of an indigent years ago. Went out into the little area in Jacksonville on the north, <coughs> northwest side. They had a place where they buried indigents. And basically what they had was just two rows of cement in the ground. And in between, you put the caskets in between those rows of cement. And that, that was basically the vault. And I remember it was just me, the funeral director, his assistant, and the body. And that was it. 
I end up leading. I, I was there at that funeral, <clears throat> and God wrote the epitaph in the hearts of myself and these two other men. We didn't even know this individual. All three of us had no clue who this man really was, what his life was all about. And I got to that funeral, and I got out to that place, and, and lo and behold, I thought, well, I'll just do this quickly because I don't know him, and they don't know him. And, and, you know, to be very honest with you, I thought, well, the time, you know, we'll just make it the way we can do it and go on down the road. And God began to touch my heart, and I, he said, look, this is a human being and, and someone I knew too. And so I began to just go ahead and do the regular funeral I would do. And I began to preach a sermon just as if there were a hundred people there. Make a long story short, I got to the conclusion, and it is my opportunity, as it always is my, uh, my habit, to give an opportunity for people to receive the Lord at that time. And I'm getting closer to it, and I'm thinking, well, I'll shut this down, don't need to do this. And the Lord says, you're forgetting something. I said, Lord, it's just us three. Make a long story short, I, I gave an altar call. I gave an opportunity for people to receive Christ. And both the funeral director and his assistant both received Christ that day. What an epithet. I said, gentlemen, I, there's nobody here but us, but I usually, and I told them, I usually give an opportunity for somebody to receive Christ. Have you received Christ? And they looked at me and said, no. And I said, would you like to receive Christ today? And they said, yes. And I shared with them how they could do that. And the assistant was the mu music director of another church. I thought, what an opportunity. But look here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 through 16. God knows every individual, folks. We're not strangers in this world. God knows us. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him, speaking of God, faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, Abraham, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. What we see here, look at verse 15. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's Sarah's epithet. By faith, God said, I love you, Sarah, because you love me and I'm preparing a place for you. Jesus told us that. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself. There where I am, there you may be also. I know where my dad and mom are. I miss them. I, I have my pro public grief. I have my private grief for them. But I know where they are. I know where all my brothers are. I know where all my family is today. And I know where all my friends are that died in Christ. I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid. We have public and we have private grief, folks. But we need to understand and not to confuse the two. We need to understand that there comes a time when the public grief stops. And there comes a time when the private grief stops. And we pick up our life and live for God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we are but flesh and dust. And Father, we, there's none of us here, Father, who have anything like eternal life apart from what God has, what you have given us through your son, Jesus. And Father God, we are unholy, and you are holy. And we are sinful, and you are holy. And oh, Father God, you have come to us and given us grace and afforded us forgiveness and given us eternal life through your son Jesus that for those of us who die in Christ will not die but yet we will live and father God we thank you for the testimony of Sarah who died at 127 but was still looking by faith for that city whose maker and builder is God 
And oh, Father God, be with those today as we conclude our services and come to the time of decision that if there's anyone who needs to make a decision about receiving this eternal life, becoming, Father, a pilgrim, a sojourner in a land that we are not a part of and that we are looking for that city whose maker and builder is God. Oh, Father God, if there is someone who desires that walk, wants to have eternal life, wants to be born again, wants to receive forgiveness of all their sins, let them come and take me by the hand, whether they be a visitor or a member, Father, and say, I want to trust in Christ. And that we would show them in the Bible how to do so, and, Father, they would have eternal life. There might be those, Father, who need to come and pray for family members, for friends, or even for themselves. Whatever decision it is made today, Father God, let it be done according to your will. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.